my title is, oh, that's my kind of worship. You know what I wish we had? I wish I had a black church. And what I mean a black church, an African-American church, if I have to be politically correct. But how many of us know when you go to Glad Tidings or you go to a church like the black churches, oh, they know how to get down. That's my kind of worship right there. But we're working on our, we're working on our worship, so we're going to be there one day. But, man, wouldn't that be awesome if we just had that Kojic feeling in the, into this? Now, we'd have to teach everybody how to clap. We'd have to teach a special class that you clap on the one and not on the two. Right, Pastor? Yes. And we'd give out certificates, and we'd bless you in Jesus' name. But my title of my message tonight is now, that's my kind of worship. If you turn your Bibles to John 4, 24, God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. You may all take your seats. I don't understand how people can worship God, be broken before him, and walk away exactly the same as they entered into the house of God. I don't understand how people can worship the loving father and yet hate their enemy, hate their neighbor. I don't understand how we can worship God. And walk away as if we worshipped an idol because we know it can't do anything for us. We worship the living God, the God of all creation, the God that can do the impossible because he is true to his word, because he is alive. He has proven to us time and time again that he is real, that he is alive, that he is a faithful God, that he's a God that doesn't lie. He's not a God that tells us empty promises and walks away and we never see him again. He's not a father that abandons us, but he's a father that remains faithful even when we abandon him. Amen? Worship isn't a location or a certain time. It's a lifestyle. It's an attitude of our heart and our spirit. Millions of people come to church to worship, but some are even void of his presence. Some come in with other spirits trying to interfere with the living spirit, with the living God. We can come to God's house and not understand why we worship. Why is it so important? Because he called us to be worshipers with a heart that has declared him as Lord and Savior. When we worship, we come in agreement with the Holy Spirit whom we worship. Truth. When the Bible says that we worship him in spirit and in truth, that means that, is, that there's no deceit in our worship that we can be confident by the Spirit that we are in the truest place in all the universe when we worship God, that there's no fake in it when we worship the Lord. How many of us have seen fakers in the church? I know when I first got saved, I could immediately call out the fakes, the hypocrites, the liars. Fake, fake, fake. Oh, they're for real. Fake, real, real, real fake. And so even when we come into worship, there's people watching us to see, are they for real? Is that a true worship? Is that in spirit and in truth? Or is that another spirit coming in? That's what I thought when I first got saved. I don't think that way anymore because I understand who my worship belongs to. How many of us know that when we come to church, it can be hard at times to come in and worship. It can be hard at times after work. You know, you've labored all day. You've had maybe challenges with your boss. Maybe you had a conflict with a coworker, Or maybe you just had one of those rough days where, you know, you woke up on the wrong side of the bed where, you know, your hair is, like, not working for you. You try to put it in a side ponytail, and it's just going on the other side. Or when your car breaks down, and you're just like, it's really one of those days. It can be hard when we come into the house of God. But the reason why we come in is because God wants to do something within our lives. When we worship God, God doesn't need our worship. We need the worship. When we come to him, he says that I inhabit the praises of his people, right? That he inclines his ears to the prayers of the saints. When we come to God, we're not here to fill God's ego. He's, when we enter into worship, he's there to remind us of who he is for us. And I love that. My husband said it earlier, when we worship God or when we give to God, it's not to benefit or it's not, it's not because God needs our money or when we worship God. It's not for us. It's to bless him. That when we come to this church, 
that we would come here to bless him and bless him only. That we're not here to, I'm going to worship Sister Bev, or I'm going to worship, you know, the men's home. No, we come here solely to worship the one and only, God. And I think sometimes, you know, we come in so religiously. We come in here routinely, unchanged, still in bondage, walking away, still having an ought with our sister or our brother. We come into the presence of God, we worship God, and we come out leaving this church the same. And something's not right when that's happening in the church. Because in the house of God, when we come in agreement in the spirit, spiritual things begin to take place. Supernatural activity begins to get activated. Super spiritual activity like deliverance, like healing, like forgiveness, like repentance, like these, those are the things that take place. But when we come into the house, sometimes we come in here and we just want to, you know, ease our conscience because of our sin. Or we want to come in and, you know, do our Catholic duties, but you're in the wrong church because we're not Catholic. But when we come into the house, there has to be a hunger. There has to be, you know, that desire to worship him in spirit and in truth because that's what he said. That there is a generation that is coming, that is coming to worship me in spirit and in truth. That religion is kicked out of the doors of the church. That religion is no longer welcomed. It never was. But Jesus had to tell this religious woman that I'm not looking for people who are religious. I'm not people, I'm not looking for people who are going to quote the word to me. But I'm looking for a generation who's going to worship me in spirit and in truth. That are going to know the revelation of who he really is. That when we come to him, we worship him in a spirit of humility, truth, transparency, with an openness. How many of us know that can be sometimes hard? It can be hard, but I'd rather do it before God than man. Because God's going to love me either way. Man's going to tell me, you can't sing a lick. You better go back to the choir because you can't have that mic. But the Lord's going to listen to me no matter what. Because he knows that my heart and my spirit are one with him. Amen. I would just want to share a couple of ways of, of that God wants us to worship him. Because I was thinking the other day I shared a little bit of what I was um, listening to the other day about a man of God who just wanted to worship God. That was it. He just wanted to walk into church and just worship God. And I just want to be like that. I want to be a woman that worships God, you know, wherever I go, that I don't get so prestigious and so, you know, um, dignified that I can't jump at the altar or raise my hands or sweat a little bit and get a little sweaty around, you know, my clothes. I want to be the woman that just is free. And, you know, we've been saved for a couple of years. It's been about 20 years now. And I'm just like, man, God, keep me fresh. Keep me on the edge of worship. Keep me fresh in your presence so I don't get stale. So that when I worship you, I don't forget why I'm worshiping you. That when I worship you, I'm worshiping you in truth and in sincerity. Not because I'm a pastor's wife. Not because I have a position and I have to do it because people are looking at me. But then when I come to God, oh, God, that I would worship him with everything that I have, my heart, my soul, my might, my strength, and that I would always keep it between him and I. One of the great stories of worship is when Miriam um, worshiped God. In Exodus 15, 20, if you want to turn your Bibles there, I'm going to share a few scriptures about how God created us to worship him in many t different times of uh, the Bible times and how they're relevant to us. But one of the great stories here in Exodus 15, 20, it says here, Then Miriam the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took the timbrel in her hand, and all the women went out after her with timbrels and with dances. And Miriam answered them, Sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and its rider he has thrown into the sea. And this was a time 
that Miriam began to worship her God in the time of triumphancy, in the time of great deliverance, in the time when, is, when Israel or the Hebrew people were delivered by, by Egypt, by the Pharaoh. And this was a time that, how many of us know that when we got saved, we began to worship God? I know I came from a lifestyle of alcoholism. I was down that road. I was demonically possessed. I was purposeless. I was empty. I was depressed. I was suicidal. But when Jesus came into my life, when he broke those chains off of me, I, there began to be a song inside of me that made me just want to worship him. And I began to lift up my voice to him. And I began to dance at that altar. And I began to dance around and give God all the praise because it was only by the power of God that I was set free. And I have stayed at this altar because I know if I had not been set free, I would be dead today. And so the way that Miriam worshipped God, he, she worshipped God in the victory, in the deliverance that took place in the Hebrew people. Another way that God wants us to worship him is to worship him in our pain. And that's hard. Because when you're in pain and in agony, it can be very confusing. Why? Why? Why would, why should I worship God in my pain? I'm hurting so bad. Why should I worship God when I've lost the love of my life? Why should I worship God when I've lost my mother or my father? This hurts. Why? Why? Some people, when they worship, when they, when they go through this type of pain, they leave God. They, they get mad at God as if it was God's fault. They, they curse God and they leave the church, the presence, everything about the Lord. And I, it boggles me. Why? Why would you leave the loving Father? Why would you leave the Father when he could comfort you in your morning? It says here in 2 Samuel 12, 20, then David arose from the earth and washed and anointed himself and changed his clothes. And he went into the house of the Lord and worshiped. And in the scripture, it, this is a very particular scripture. But it says that he arose from the earth, meaning he was prostrate before the Lord. He went, washed his face, anointed himself, changed his clothes, and worshiped God. Now, that sounds like a normal scripture, but you got to know the story. And what happened here is his son, who was just an infant, got sick. And he was mourning, praying, fasting before the Lord, day and night, asking the Lord, be merciful to my son. Be merciful to this child. Let him live. And the child died. And when he, when he found out that the child had died, he didn't get angry with God. He didn't get bitter with God. He didn't blame God. You evil God, you took away my son. No. He blessed God. Even in his grief, in his mourning, he went. And it says that he went into the house of the Lord and worshipped. That as he was prostrated before the Lord in his mourning, he went back into the temple and prostrated before the Lord and worshipped him even when he lost his own son. That's pretty heavy. How many of us can say that you would worship God in such a time of grief? I know I did. I know my husband did. We were young, 22 and 23, I believe, when we both lost our mother and our father. And I'm going to be honest, I never considered leaving God. I never considered backsliding because of the death that we both had experienced. I never considered it. Because I knew without God, I'm nothing. I knew that the Lord allowed my, my family to pass away because he knew I could handle it. I knew that the word said that blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. And so when I mourned, I mourned in Christ. I mourned knowing that there was a father that was holding me. I mourned knowing that there was a father that was carrying me through the season of my pain. I mourned in a season knowing that God was going to carry me in every part of my grief. There was a, even a time where I almost had a breakdown because I didn't know how to grieve. 
And even at that time, the Lord kept me sane. The Lord kept my mind in a sound place. And so when we go through pain, God doesn't say, stop worshiping me. God doesn't say, oh, because you're going through it, go stay home and don't come to church and, you know, cut yourself off from the people of God. Don't read your Bible. No. When we go through mourning and pain, even more so, drown ourselves in the word. Even more so, drown ourselves in worship. Even more so, commit, com- continue to keep ourselves connected to the Bible, to the word, to the people of God. We worship him not just in our triumphancies. We worship him even in our defeats. We worship him even in our times of discouragement. And I think sometimes we forget that it's hard to serve God. People think, well, why is this happening to me? And why do I have to go through this? If you read your word, you would know that the scripture says we will go through many hardships. We will enter into many hardships before we enter into the kingdom of heaven. So it's not something that we're surprised by. But the Bible says we will go through it. It will be a journey. It will be tempting at times to backslide or to do sin or to fall into whatever the enemy's tempting us with. It'll be hard. And if somebody told you that serving God was easy, they lied to you. And so I'm going to tell you right now, it's not easy serving God. But, it's, but you can do it. It's possible. It's possible. I did it. I worshiped God in my pain, and I, it was possible. And not only was I in my pain, but let me tell you, when I came out of that pain, I laughed harder than anybody in the room. I experienced a joy that I didn't have before my mom had passed, that I experienced new hope and new faith that I didn't have prior to that death. And so even when I worshiped in pain, there was new experiences, experiences that God allowed me to encounter. God is good, right? He's good. Another reason why we worship God is because he's the creator. He fearfully and wonderfully made us. He made us in his image. In Psalms 139, it says, I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. Look at your neighbor and say, man, you're fearfully and wonderfully made. That's why I got to worship God. When I look at my husband, I look at him, man, boo, he's my booski. You are so fearfully and wonderfully made. I need to praise God right now. Shut up. Lord, thank you for my man, Jesus. Sometimes you got to give God the praise. Come on, Shana. When you look at Matt, your booski, don't you want to praise God? Oh, shut up. Oh, come on, Juan. You need to start praising God because the Lord's going to give you a booski too. Come on now. See, you don't even have a woman yet, but you need to start praising God anyways because he's going to make her fearfully and wonderful just for you. Amen. In Romans 8, 16, it says the spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Isn't that awesome? That we are God's children. That's why we can worship him. I know at one time I was lost, I was blind, I wasn't even a part of the body, and I was condemned to hell. But when God saved me, oh God, oh when God saved me, I I just entered into the royal house, into the royal family of God, and I'm inheriting the kingdom of heaven. And one day I'm going to be with my Savior, with my Lord and Savior, and it's going to be awesome. And so that's why we got to worship God, because you and I are children of the living God. Another reason why we worship him is because he redeemed us. It's because of Jesus purchased, it's because of Jesus purchasing us with his blood. No longer are we condemned to hell, but now we have been reconciled to the Father and one day be joined with him. In Galatians 3.15, it says, Christ bought us with his blood and made us free from the law. In that way, the law could not punish us. Christ did this by carrying the load and by being punished instead of us. I'm going to read that one more time. Christ did this by carrying the load and being punished instead of us. Think about the most excruciating pain you've ever felt. Think about it. Have you ever had your hand slammed in a car? Stubbed your toe? Maybe you were shot? 
Maybe you got jumped. Maybe you were so, your soul was in such grief or you were so depressed and miserable that you just thought death was the only answer. He took all that. He paid the penalty. He went through the torment and the pain and the agony for us so that you and I don't have to go through it. My God, that's some heavy stuff. You really got to think about that, that I don't have to be whipped. I don't have to be mocked, flogged, mocked, made fun of. I don't have to go through that. Some of us, we can't even handle being corrected and rebuked because you get offended. So you leave the church. But our Savior took all the offenses. Our Savior took every offense and did it because he loved us. My God, isn't that heavy? Another reason why we worship him is because he commands us. When we come into worship and you don't have any other reason to worship him, you worship him because he commanded it. It says in Matthew 4.10, love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind. He says in Luke 10.27, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind. We worship him to be reminded of his love. We worship him because we are reminded of his love. I came as a sinner condemned. I got saved, sanctified, Holy Ghost filled. There have been times in my salvation where I came to God feeling condemned again because maybe I fell really short of his glory because I intentionally sinned against the Heavenly Father. In my 20 years of my salvation, I haven't been perfect. I've tried my best but I have fallen short. I have made mistakes. I have fallen and I've gotten back up. But there have been times when I fell short that I would try to enter into the presence of God and I just felt so shameful. And I would beat my chest and say, oh God, I'm nothing but a sinner. And I would repent. But I remember this one time I, I had fallen very short and I was embarrassed, I was ashamed. I shared with my husband what I was going through. And I remember I went to God. And I was worshiping the Lord at the altar. And I just felt like, man, Lord, I'm going to go to hell. How could you love me? How could you accept me? And man's mind, we're so little. We're so limited. We're so, excuse the expression, we're so dumb sometimes. You know, the way we perceive God is so, ugh, so minute, so in, doesn't do any justice. But I remember I, I was there at the altar, and I came to God so humiliated and embarrassed and shameful. And I just was like, God, I'm going straight to hell. And all of a sudden, I saw God, and I saw him cradling me. And he was cradling me, and he was adoring me like a, like a child being adored by their father. And I just remember broken, like God was saying, I love you, and I adore you, and I don't hold this against you. Because I had come into a place of, of worship and repentance. And I just remember I began to cry because I could see God just cradling me, not condemning me. Not telling me what a horrible sinner I was, but that he loved me and that he saw past my sins and that he saw that I was repentful. And I was just so blown away and I just was so broken. And it's a reminder that when God did that to me, I was reminded that you are to love the same. You are not to hold condemnation against your neighbor. You are not to condemn the one that you think should be condemned. You are not to hold sin over people's head because of what they've done. And so that's, that experience is a reminder of what God did for me, a reminder so that I could do the same. In Romans 8.38, I'm almost done. In Romans 8.38, I love the scripture. God's love is so deep. 
In Romans 8, 38, it says, For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor anything created shall be able to separate us from the love of our God which is in Christ Jesus. There's another uh, scripture that says, nor heaven or hell can separate us from the love of God. And when I think of that, I think, wait a minute. What do you mean heaven or hell can't separate us from the love of God? I know in heaven I'm going to receive your love. But when I received the scripture, I was like, man, God, even those people who are burning in hell, your love doesn't even stop for them. That his love overrides hell for those people. So even though those people were disobedient and they're burning in, the, in that place, God's love is never separated even from them because that's how deep God's love is. That's heavy. Do you, did you guys catch that? That's how deep God's love is for us. And that's why we worship him because his love always needs to be revealed so that we know who he is. The last thing that God would, would or the last way that God would want us to worship him is in wrongful treatment. Worshiping him and even in wrongful treatment. And in Acts 16, 23, 28, it says, after they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. When he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and other prisoners were listening to, listening to them. Suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundation of the prisons were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open, and everyone's chains came loose. The jailer woke up, and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself. We're all here. This is such a beautiful scripture because when we worship God, worshiping God doesn't just benefit us. Like Tyrone said, when you answer the call, when you're obedient to the call, it doesn't just benefit you. It benefits everybody else around you. Amen? And this is what happened with Paul and Silas. As they began to worship God in their wrongful treatment, they were being persecuted. They were being thrown in prison for preaching the gospel. That even in the wrongdoing, they worshiped God. And because they worshiped God, chains were broken. Lives were changed. This guard that was ready to commit suicide because he thought all the prisoners had escaped, he even got saved. And not only did he get saved, but the Bible says that his whole family got saved. And so when we worship God, we got to come to God in spirit and in truth. When you worship God, you worship in your pain. When you're going through the fiery furnace, you worship God in that fiery furnace. When you're going through the mountaintop and you're being triumphant, you worship God. When you're at your lowest point, you worship God. You know why? Because there are souls in the balance. Because there are people watching us worshiping God. Because they're trying to see if you're for the if you're the real deal. They're trying to see if you're the worshiper in spirit and in truth. And when they see that, lives get changed. And here, the soldier, this guardsman, his life was changed because of somebody's worship in time of wrongful treatment. That's heavy. That Paul and Silas, they didn't get caught up. Oh, don't you know who I am? I'm an apostle. How dare you wrongfully persecute me? I don't want to worship God. I'm in prison right now. But they worshiped God in their imprisonment, in their wrongful treatment. And because they worshiped, lives got changed, transformed. Lives were baptized, touched by the Spirit of God. That's pretty awesome, isn't it? When we come and we worship the Lord, our worship is a reminder of how amazingly crazy good he has been to us. How many of us can testify that God has been ridiculously crazy, amazingly crazy good to us? 
if you, ha- if you haven't experienced it, I want you to experience it tonight. But I promise you, when you worship God, when you experience the power of God, man, I have experienced crazy favor over my life. I have experienced crazy financial blessing over my life. I have experienced a crazy, you know, blessed, anointed family. I don't deserve none of that. But when you worship him in spirit and truth, man, there's things that begin to take place. And we're reminded of how good he is. Even in worship, we're, not the, we're the ones that he allows to benefit from it. He's constantly waiting for worship to take place so he can release his blessing on us, his refreshment on us, his anointing on us. I want to live a life that stays away from religion. I don't want to be a woman that lives the old pattern of yesterday, a pattern that never changes. I want to be a woman that keeps her heart broken and contrite before God because he says those are the ones he doesn't despise. I want to be a woman of God that cries out to God, and when he hears my cry, he takes ear to it and takes, he takes a, a listening ear. And what I'm, whatever I'm asking for, even if I'm just worshiping, that he would bless me with his presence. I want to be a woman that when I worship, that it would lead me to a place of repentance. Because that's what worship does. Worship doesn't condemn us. It leads us to a place of repentance. A worship that keeps us on our knees, humble without fear of rejection. God is looking for people to worship him and spirit and in truth. And as I have the, the worship team come on up, this is your own altar call. But I want to be a woman, and I want this church. I know this is something that my husband desires as well, and even the ministers and the wives. But I want to stay a church that worships God and knows why. That we wouldn't become stale, that we wouldn't become, you know, religious and I'm a leader, so let me worship. No. But that when you and I come to this house, you, there would be no other agendas. That whatever concerns we have, keep those concerns, come to the altar, and then give them to God. Because I would be lying if I said, forget about your worries. No, I've learned to take my worries and cast them into the presence of God. And I want to make sure that as Victor Outreach Heart of the Bay, we don't become a stale, religious, dead church. And what I mean church, I mean you and I. Because we're the bride of Christ. We're the church. So if you're still and you're dead, then that means our church is dead. And so when we come here, men and women, gang, let's come here every time you come to church. Come in agreement with the Holy Spirit. Come in agreement with the Father's presence. Come in agreement with transparency. Come in agreement with no fear of rejection. And so when you lift up your hands, remember he's right there waiting for you so he can inhabit your praise. Waiting for you so he can bless you with a breakthrough. Waiting for you that when you worship, The blessings go up, the praises go up, and what comes down? The blessing. How many of us believe that when you worship, God can do the impossible? How many of us know that when you worship God, God gives us the breakthrough? And if you don't know that tonight, I challenge you to come up to this altar right now. And if you need a breakthrough, you come to this altar.